Hey everyone, how are you all doing today? I need a little more excitement in the room, come on. All right, well, today we're going to talk about something really exciting that's generating a lot of buzz in the community. Over the next 25 minutes, you're going to learn how to write a component once and render it anywhere. I'm talking web, native, VR, sketch, and more, without changing any lines of code. Does that sound cool? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself. Shalom. My name is Peggy Razis, and you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, and Medium at my handle right there. And as you can see, I've had an awesome time in Israel so far. I even made some new friends on the tour. <laughs> I, I work at Meteor Development Group on the Apollo team building open source GraphQL tools. And previously, I was working at Major League Soccer as an engineer on the UI team. Uh, my talk actually isn't about GraphQL today at all, but uh, I, I do think that Apollo Client complements a universal components architecture very nicely. And I'll explain more about that later in my talk. So before I tell you what cross-platform component libraries are and the problems that they solve, I want to give you some context first. So in the beginning, we had React on the web. And we all thought it was awesome, clearly judging by the amazing international community we have here today. Uh, React allowed us to build beautiful UIs pretty quickly and iterate upon them. So then came the custom renderers that brought React's success on the web to native platforms. The first of which was React Native. And React Native was so great that it inspired several forks on Windows and Mac OS and Apple TV. And, and more recently, we also have custom renders for Web VR and Sketch now, which is super exciting. So needless to say, React Native was a hit. So just a quick show of hands, who here has used React Native before? OK, a couple of you, awesome. Um, so check out these stats from the last state of JavaScript survey. Uh, over 10,000 developers responded, and they reported a 92% satisfaction rating for React Native. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think about the last time that 92% of developers agreed upon anything. I mean, we're still arguing over spaces and tabs here, so this is pretty astounding. And there are a lot of reasons uh, why that satisfaction rating is so high and why developers are continuing to bet on React Native. So with Pan Responder, you have an intuitive way to handle sophisticated multi-touch gestures. You have StyleSheet, a built-in CSS and JS solution that allows you to co-locate your styles with your React components and dynamically update, update them when props change. With the animated API, it's easy to create performant declarative animations to enhance your UI. And you also have Yoga, which is Facebook's cross-platform layout engine. Now, don't worry if that sounds a little confusing right now. All you need to know um, is that it uses Flexbox by default for positioning your UI. So all of this was really exciting. And not too long after React Native was officially released, Nicholas Gallagher at Twitter released React Native Web to bring these APIs and building blocks and this awesome developer experience over to web development. So yeah, when I first heard about this, I thought it was weird too. I mean, you bring React over to the web, with, from the web to native with React Native, and now you're trying to bring React Native over to the web. It sounds a little strange, but in reality, I think he was ahead of his time. When you look at the React ecosystem in totality and where it seems to be heading, it actually doesn't seem that strange. So at the most granular, granular level, all of the building blocks or primitives, and I'm gonna use that term primitives a lot throughout my talk today. Um, all of those primitives for the platforms on the right are all the same. They also share the same APIs for styling, animation, and gesture handling. So theoretically, you can write a pretty basic component using React Native primitives and have it work on every single one of those platforms just by changing the renderer that you're importing from. <laughs> 
And in fact, the odd one out here is actually the web. The web's primitives are tied to the DOM. So instead of building our components with views and text, we're building them with divs and H1 tags. And styling and animation are not implemented in a uniform way here. So just to put it in perspective, uh, DOM primitives were actually standardized in 1998. And that's the same year that NSYNC released their debut album. <laughs> DOM primitives are almost 20 years old, so it kind of like begs the question, why are we building modern applications with primitives stuck in the 90s? Our websites don't look like this anymore. We need a new set of primitives that better reflect modern application development for the mobile web. And luckily for us, we kind of already have the primitives and APIs we need with React Native. I love this quote from Jordan Walk, the creator of React. In his interview with Reactiflux, he advocated for further unifying React and React Native for mobile app development. So how do we accomplish this goal and bring the joys of React Native development to the web? I actually think this is a pretty difficult problem to solve, and it won't fully materialize without uh, some advancements in support from browser vendors. I mean, who knows? Maybe someday we'll get a React Native app browser. Ken Wheeler uh, built an excellent proof of concept for one, and I highly encourage you to check out his talk if the subject interests you. And I'm gonna compile a bunch of links into a GitHub repository that I'll post at the end so you can discover if you're interested. But until all of that happens, we need to play the hand that we're dealt. So there's actually a solution that you can start building today, and that's universal components. So first I wanna explain what they are, and I also wanna introduce the concept of a universal application, because I think it's important to contrast the two. Um, so universal components are platform agnostic components compatible with any renderer. And when I say renderer, I mean things like web VR, sketch, web, native. Um, and they're built with React Native primitives and APIs. So with universal components, you separate the business logic by platform, but you compose your features with universal shared components. To share these components, you would publish them in an NPM package and consume them in each separate application, which is probably living in its own repository. So you can kind of think of building these universal components as writing once and rendering anywhere. And this is what we're going to cover in detail today. In contrast, you can think of developing a universal application as writing it once and running it anywhere you will need some kind of intermediate layer between your UI and the platform to determine the render in a universal application. Universal applications are actually built with both universal and platform specific components. You can kind of think of universal components as a more incremental approach to this goal. So we're not actually gonna cover universal applications today, but if you're interested, I highly encourage you to check out uh, Create React Native Web App and Create React XP App by Natter Dabit. And once again, I'll post the link to these projects in my GitHub repo after the talk. So three libraries have emerged to cover these needs, and all of them are excellent. So the first is React Native Web, and that was developed by Nicholas Gallagher at Twitter. Um, it's actually been battle tested in production with Twitter Lite, their new progressive web app. And second, we have React Primitives. And now that was developed by Leland Richardson at Airbnb. He gave a really excellent talk on it at Chain React that you should check out if you're more interested um, in this library. You also have React XP, and that was developed by Microsoft. Uh, it's the newest of the three, and it's used by the Skype team in production. If you'd like to see a comparison of these libraries explaining how they work and maybe some of their trade-offs, you should check out the first version of this talk that I gave. Um, and all my slides are clickable, so you can just follow the link below. Today, however, we're going to focus on React Native Web in order to build our universal components. It has the highest platform parity of all the libraries. And what I mean by platform parity here is how similar it is to React Native. I actually ran the numbers. React Native Web supports 21 out of 43 React Native APIs. Now that's things like style sheet and dimensions. And nine of those 43 that are unsupported are actually iOS and Android specific. Now for components, React Native Web supports over half. 
So if you combine the two and subtract out the irrelevant platform specific APIs and components, React Native Web supports around three quarters of what's available in React Native. And I'd also like to point out here that the way React Native Web works is by acting as a compatibility layer on top of DOM primitives. So you can write React Native code that ultimately renders to divs and spans. So you're probably wondering with a healthy dose of skepticism whether universal components built with React Native Web are production ready or if this is just like another JavaScript hipster fad. Um, but my answer to this question is a resounding yes. React Native Web is already being used in production by large companies today. Twitter uh, uses React Native Web for their progressive web app, Twitter Lite. And in order for Twitter to use React Native Web in production, they had to solve enterprise level problems at scale, like right to left layout and also accessibility. And I also wanna point out here that this architecture is not just for greenfield applications. Twitter has been incrementally migrating their component base to React Native Web. So it's entirely possible for you um, to render your new universal components besides your old ones. We also used it in production at Major League Soccer for our real-time match experience on the web. And everything you see here is actually built with universal components, so it's really exciting. So, one of the things that might have concerned you when I told you that React Native Web renders to divs and spans um, is that it's a huge concern for accessibility reasons because there is no way to preserve uh, your semantic markup for screen readers. So in fact, they actually thought about this problem. There are built-in accessibility APIs to make sure that you can apply the correct ARIA role to your DOM elements. So a div that you, you intended to be a button can be read as a div um, and so on and so forth. So that's really important uh, just to make sure that your applications are accessible to all users. React Native Web is also performant. React Native Web style sheet implementation is on par or faster than most popular CSS and JS libraries today. How it works is it extracts your styles into CSS, it applies a class name for each unique declaration, and then it memoizes them at runtime to improve performance. So, aside from all these benefits, adopting this architecture also increases your team's velocity. So instead of developing a feature once times the number of platforms you're supporting, you'll only have to write a universal component once, dramatically increasing your code reuse. You'll also be able to standardize your third-party libraries across platforms. So instead of having a calendar library for web and a separate one for native with a whole other API that you have to learn, you can just use one, resulting in less duplication of work. So just by configuring a couple things in your build process, you can actually use React Native libraries on the web. And the reason why all of this is possible is React Native Web's almost complete feature parity with React Native as we discussed earlier. So let's dive into some code so I can show you how to do that. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do in your project is alias React Native Web to React Native. And here I'm showing this uh, with Webpack, but you can also achieve the same thing through uh, the Babel plugin module resolver. So since React Native modules are in ES6, you're going to have to compile them with Babel in your Webpack build in order to use them on the web. So to tell the Babel loader to process the React Native module, you're going to want to add the module's name as a negative look ahead to the exclusion regex. And you'll need to do this for every React Native module that you plan to use on the web. So sometimes your React Native module will contain code that has already been compiled. In the case of Victory Native, uh, which is a charting library, Victory shares a couple core modules with the web. However, the React Native version points to the uncompiled ES6 code. So if this is the case, you're just going to want to point Webpack to the compiled code instead. So you're probably asking yourself, how do I know which libraries are web compatible? Surely not all of them can be. So the one-stop shop for determining web compatibility is Native Directory. 
And recently, I partnered with the folks at Expo to add web compatibility features to Native Directory, their curated list of React Native libraries. So all you need to do here is just check the filter to find what you're looking for, and you'll find a list of all React Native web compatible libraries. I just want to give a quick shout out to Jim Lee, who was able to execute this feature super quickly before my talk. Really appreciate it. Um, and in the upcoming weeks, I'm going to perform an audit to add more web compatible libraries to the list. But I'm not going to be able to do this alone. I need your help. So if you're using React Native libraries on the web that aren't listed, please send a pull request to add it. And if you're a maintainer of a popular React Native library, you should consider adding uh, instructions to use your library on web in your readme. So, all right, I'm gonna switch gears for a second. Um, I know this architecture is very new, so I wanna just answer some of the questions that the community has about universal components. So recently I just posed the question to my followers on Twitter uh, to see what people were curious about. So let's start off by briefly discussing how to write render agnostic components. So a lot of the best practices with React in general actually apply to universal components. You want to keep them as small and focused as possible. And I like to do this with a top level wrapper component that passes its data down to any amount of child components. So for this example, and for a couple examples throughout my talk, we're just going to be using a simple movie card that passes down a movie prop to all of its children. So the way you kind of want to think about this as you're developing is think of your universal components as your primitives for features in your application that you can then compose based on the platform. So here we're rendering a poster, a title, and a plot inside a card. But these could also be standalone components used in other parts of your application. So just continue to think of reusability as you're developing. So with that being said, it's actually really difficult to make all of your components universal. Sometimes you're going to need an escape hatch. And that's okay because we have one. Um, so for small one-off changes, you're going to want to use the platform module. And this is great for things like styling differences that don't affect the overall logic of your universal component. And you can just do a quick switch case there. Now, for bigger, more substantial differences, you can use platform extensions. And you will need to configure this in your Webpack build. Here's where this comes in handy. You can prefix your file extension with the platform. So .web.js, .ios.js, .vr.js, et cetera. And Webpack and the React Native Packager will know where to resolve to depending on the platform. So this is really great for things like linking where the implementation varies significantly between platforms. You're gonna wanna split that up with a platform extension here. So how do we test our universal components? A really helpful tool for this uh, is React Storybook. And if you're unfamiliar with React Storybook, it's an interactive development and testing environment for your React components. And what it does is it removes the platform out of the equation so you can focus on writing your components quickly. By developing our components in isolation and keeping them focused, we can iterate much faster. I like to use the web version of Storybook to ensure that my universal components then work on the web. So another really cool feature is that you can automatically convert your stories to snapshots in Jest. So that just saves you a little bit of development and maintenance time because you don't have to write them yourself. All right, so we're developing our components in Storybook. Now, what about styling? So personally, I stick with style sheet, but you can use libraries like Glamorous Native too if you're familiar with more of a styled components like API. It's really up to you, but I would advise you to keep the performance benchmarks that I mentioned earlier in mind and just run them for yourself on your own project. So one of the problems you're going to have to tackle right away with styling is the variation of screen sizes. So luckily, if you're already following responsive design practices with your web components, this shouldn't be too bad. Now, if you're designing a component for desktop, you can easily port those styles over to Apple TV um, because of the wide screen size. And on the flip side, if you're already uh, developing styles for the mobile web, you can apply them to React Native. 
So to determine the media size on web, you can use a library like React Media for media queries and pass down a top level media prop, either through maybe context or a higher order component. Um, and on native, you can use the dimensions API and the on layout um, event handler to determine whether the phone is in portrait mode or turned over in landscape. So then, uh, once you have your props like media and orientation, um, you can pass them into a function that returns the output from stylesheet.create, just like you see here. All right, so we can style our components, but what about fetching data? So I think this is a perfect use case for Apollo. And this is not just because I work there. Um, I was actually a huge fan of Apollo for universal components, even when I was working at Major League Soccer. So if you're unfamiliar with Apollo, it's a GraphQL client that manages data fetching and updating your UI for you. You can kind of think as a, of Apollo as a universal data solution for your universal components. And it's used in production by a number of large companies ranging from Ticketmaster to Airbnb. It's also easy to integrate into your app incrementally, so you don't have to refactor your whole application at once. Um, you can use it side by side with your existing Redux reducers, for example. The reason why Apollo is a universal data solution is it because it supports any client, including React Native and even Sketch, without any additional configuration. You just get this for free. And I think this Sketch example is really cool because now designers don't have to mock up data. They can fetch and design with real data, which I think is a really interesting development in the space. The other cool thing about Apollo is that your components only need to request the data that they need. Now this aligns really nicely with the modular philosophy of universal components, since the goal is to keep them small and focused. Now with Apollo, you can write your queries once and run them on any platform. You can even publish shared GraphQL containers to an NPM package along with your universal components and use them side by side to compose features in your application. So even though universal components are really useful, there are definitely some challenges because the ecosystem is so new. So one of the challenges here is Flexbox performance is still an issue in WebKit and older browsers. However, there is a workaround uh, which I've listed here. So I believe this is fixed in the newest version of WebKit, but it's still something to keep in mind as you're developing your universal components. Cross-platform SVGs can be difficult as well, especially for some more newer experimental platforms like Sketch. Luckily, a solution exists for web and native. SVGs by GoDaddy is a compatibility layer that allows you to use the React Native SVG API to render SVG elements in the browser. Now this is essential for using libraries like React Native vector icons and Victory Native on the web, which both rely heavily upon SVG. VR can also be tough for a number of reasons. Um, so one is that units of measurement in VR are actually in meters, they're not in pixels, um, unless you decide to wrap your 2D components in what's called a cylindrical panel. Then you can use pixels, so just keep that in mind as you're developing for VR. Um, it can also be really hard to normalize user input events um, since there are so many to account for. You have things like gaze tracking, you have keyboards, you have a bunch of different handheld controllers. Um, so that's another difficulty that you might face when developing universal components for VR. Um, also, you're limited to view, image, and text, text for cross-platform components. So just keep that in mind as well. Okay, so that was a lot of information to throw at you all at once, um, but if you take away one thing from this talk, even if you don't plan on executing a cross-platform strategy anytime soon, is this. Be open-minded to new platforms and possibilities. As our world becomes more connected, new platforms will emerge, possibly as a React custom renderer. And if you're a library maintainer, you also have to account for the possibility that people may be using your libraries in ways you never expected. React is truly becoming a platform for application development. So just try to think of the bigger picture. Thank you all so much. You've been a fabulous audience. <laughs>